Welcome to Mechanic Design 101, where we trace the history of mechanics in Fire Emblem and beyond to see how small mechanical changes can carry longer lasting implications. If you're interested in exploring other possible design ideas or just want to know how we ended up where we're at, this is the resource for you. This week, a primer on magic, the necessary information that we need to cover before we can specifically talk about mages. This is a bit more dense than my usual Unit Design 101 lessons, but it's necessary to get this out of the way so our actual discussion of mages in the following Unit Design 101 won't get bogged down by having to explain how magic works in every single game. To cover the ground rules, I will be talking about magic systems in Fire Emblem, the differences between types of mages as relevant, and breaking down their general impact and usefulness. As we go through the series, we will take a look at why mages in each game generally feel good or bad. I will do more videos in the future talking about the specific types of mages and their design, but this groundwork is vital to understanding what makes mages work in general. As a core, Magic and Fire Emblem is a bypass of defense, being reduced by an entirely different stat in resistance, which is often, but not always, low in units with high defense and high in units with low defense. This allows mages to deal high damage to units that physical units have difficulty harming, such as armor knights and wyverns, while doing very little against otherwise fragile units, such as pegasus knights and enemy mages. Most games' mages use tomes, but some learn spells innately instead. Magic is generally very flexible, with 1-2 to two range being standard, and often having higher accuracy than physical weapons, though often with a steeper accuracy drop-off for higher rank spells. Spells are also the most likely weapons to have special effects, be it increased range, life drain, special damage calculations, stat reduction, or more. If a game has any special weapon effects outside of effective damage against types, you're most likely to find them in spells. Magic also has changed more across the series than anything else. In FE1, there was no magic stat. Fire would always do 5 damage, whether it was cast by a level 1 mage or a level 20 bishop. This made unique tome access, like Merrick's 13 damage 100 accuracy Excalibur, or Lin's 20 damage aura, a very notable quality for the unpromoted mages of FE1 that pre-promotes didn't get. In both FE1 and Gaiden, spells bypassed terrain avoid, making mages experts at attacking entrenched positions, like bosses on gates and thrones, or pretty much any defensive terrain in Gaiden. And speaking of Gaiden, magic there was changed drastically along with the weapon system. Mages learn spells innately after leveling up a certain number of times, and cast spells with an HP cost instead of spending weapon uses. This learned magic system wouldn't return until Shadows of Valentia, Gaiden's remake, and Three Houses, with some additional changes. Mages also increased spell damage using the power stat in Gaiden, just like physical units would with weapons, and resistance was present on most units, though with no growths, so a unit's base resistance was pretty much all they had. Female and male mages were also split into different class lines, with female mages going into Priestess, Effie's first hybrid physical magical class, and male mages promoting into Sage, with an HP restoring adjacency effect. Generally all mages have some usefulness in Gaiden, with the only thing affecting spell accuracy being luck, but tend to feel like glass cannons because of the high HP cost of the more powerful spells. Mystery of the Emblem introduced the first Siege Tomes, or dedicated long-range magic spells. These tomes have high weight and power, can attack at up to 10 range, and are very rarely given to the player, often only appearing as one or maybe two copies of each siege tome, if at all. Generally, enemies get siege tomes roughly halfway through the game, starting on bosses, but broadly being given to awkwardly placed mages or sages to threaten large sections of the map in similar ways to the ballistas of future games. Genealogy split Strength and Magic, a split that has lasted every game since, except for the GBA games and SOV. In a split that has been more divisive, Genealogy split spells into multiple types, Fire, Thunder, Wind, Light, and Dark, with different classes being restricted to different spell types. Most future games in the series have accounted for this divide in some way, but seldom in the specific pattern of FE4. In terms of effectiveness, mages and genealogy were a mixed bag. Having low movement and limited spell options, mages often were only as good as the tomes that they had access to, requiring specific attention and focus to level up to the point of self-sufficiency beyond powerful tools like Light and Forseti. You also had a split between mage classes, some of which would become sages that could use staves, others which would become mage knights who got horses, and still others would become mage fighters who got swords. Mage Knights are by far the most mobile class, and generally were preferred for combat, 
while the staff axis of sages was high utility and the sword axis of mage fighters was rarely relevant. Thracia introduced trainable weapon ranks, which when combined with the magic type split, made training a mage to use a particularly high ranked tome like Meteor or Blizzard take dedicated effort. Mages with good starting ranks or powerful personal spells like Asbel with Graf Caliber were game defining in power, but mages with poor starts like Miranda were far worse than prior games mages tended to be. Thracia also introduced more spells with unique effects beyond Nosferatu's life drain, such as Poison, Stone, or Hell, and set the precedent that dark magic was for unique effects. At least for enemies, because despite Salem's propensity to use dark magic, these spells were either inaccessible or had their extra effects removed when used by the player. The GBA games removed the anima split but retained the light-dark anima triangle. Subdivision of the mage classes followed suit. Fast and skillful monks got the weaker and crit-focused light magic. Well-balanced mages got a variety of damage, accuracy, and weights to pick from in the anima spell list, and stronger, bulkier shamans got the rare, special effect ridden dark magic. This ended up meaning that anima mages were generally the best, as they had far more options to pick from when balancing between damage, accuracy, and weight, shamans were limited to flux for most situations, and monks had a poor selection of weapons with iffy accuracy and horribly high weight for mediocre damage and only decent crit, meaning both shamans and monks needed higher stats than mages to perform similarly, outside of the unique niche that shamans provided via Nosferatu and Luna. Moving along, in Path of Radiance, magic was split back to the Thracia era, with anima being split into fire, thunder, and wind, dark magic being removed, and light magic re-inheriting Nosferatu. The three tracts of elemental magic were given effective damage, fire against beasts, wind against flyers, and thunder against dragons. Now this might seem like magic was given a useful anti laguz niche, and it was true that Laguz generally sported lower resistance than defense, however with each magic type being ranked up separately, the spells themselves being very weak, and effective damage only doubling weapon might, mages did not prove to be effective laguz counters. Additional factors led to mages being even worse than other units, including but not limited to an increase of plus one mobility for every class except mages compared to GBA mobility, much higher resistance on most units in general compared to prior games, and generally subpar stats in terms of bases, growths, and caps. If you want a more detailed breakdown of all the failings of mages in Path of Radiance and Radiant Dawn, I have another video going into detail on exactly that topic. Radiant Dawn made three changes to magic from Path of Radiance. Thunder was made effective against Wyvern Riders instead of Wind. Thunder was made weaker and less accurate in exchange for higher crit rate, and a very small number of dark mages were present, though dark magic had lost pretty much all of its unique effects and was merely a heavy, inaccurate, and somewhat high might set of tomes, usable by only very few units, playable or otherwise. Shadow Dragon and New Mystery of the Emblem returned to magic being a single weapon rank and allowed the previously personal tomes of Excalibur and Aura to be used by units with sufficient tome rank, only giving special early access to Merrick and Lind respectively. Awakening kept tomes as a single rank, but introduced the concept of dark magic as a limited modifier. All mages could use normal magic, but only dark mages or those with shadow gift could use tomes labeled dark. These tomes were usually less accurate but more powerful versions of their generic counterparts, and included spells with special effects like Nosferatu and Waste. This classifying of spells as Dark is solely used as a limiting factor to encourage use of the Dark Mage and Sorcerer class line, and while it cuts down on build freedom, it can certainly do its job if Dark Magic spells are deemed powerful enough by the player base. Fates kept this limitation of dark magic specifically for Nosferatu, limiting only that spell to Norian dark mages and sorcerers. Fates also introduced the Spirit Scrolls, magic tomes that adjusted the user's stats when equipped. With a wider variety of magic using classes and only a single tome labeled as dark, the sorcerer class line was only desirable for its specific class skills and high magic stats, though Nosferatu's life drain effect was still impactful enough that even with all its new restrictions, it could still be an effective draw. Mages as a whole, in Awakening and Fates, existed in a somewhat middling space. They weren't as overshadowed by other units as mages were in Path of Radiance or Radiant Dawn, but outside of a few specific builds, they weren't completely dominant either. They mostly capitalized on strong, penalty-free 1-2 range access that targeted resistance, a stat that for the vast majority of enemies was still significantly lower than physical defense. As SOV was a remake of Gaiden, it had much the same magic system. Three Houses then took the spell learning system into a very unique direction. Every unit had a unique spell list to them, which they learned at specific ranks of Faith for Light Magic or Reason for Black and Dark Magic. 
Some units had more unique spells or better access than others, which worked well with Three Houses' open class system. Only certain classes could use magic, but if you were in a magic-enabled class, you could use any of the spells that unit had learned. Each spell was given a set number of casts per map, rather than costing HP or being limited by weapon durability, encouraging tactical use of particular spells every single map, as opposed to either blasting out whatever your strongest option was every time, or holding back all your spells in reserve for future maps. Faith Magic, or White Magic, held most of the healing on pure utility spells, but also contained combat spells in the form of Nosferatu and Abraxas. Black Magic and Dark Magic were both purely combat-focused, with Black Magic being elemental spells of fire, lightning, wind, and ice, with a few special effects, and Dark Magic having stat reduction, bonus damage, or other additional impact beyond their damage. Enemies in Three Houses, like in Path of Radiance and Radiant Dawn, had generally comparable resistance to defense, with exceptions primarily being armor knights and clerics on either end of the spectrum. This meant that most mages were limited on their ability to defeat enemies easier than physical classes, giving that power only to those mages with the highest magic stats. The last game on our list for this overview is Engage, a game that once again treated tomes like other weapons. Fire, Wind, and Thunder were branched out but not given separate ranks, instead being given more unique identities. Fire for general purpose damage, Wind was slightly weaker in every way but dealt effective damage versus flyers, and Thunder was given 1-3 to three range but prevented from doubling. Additional spells were few and far between, mostly existing as emblem weapons, but Surge was introduced as the first ever guaranteed accurate weapon of Fire Emblem, though it was locked to 1 range. As for how mages as a whole were treated, like Three Houses before it, most enemies had comparable resistance to their defense, meaning mages in theory were more effective against some enemies than others, but in practice just had higher magic and speed benchmarks to be able to one-round enemies. Mystic-type classes, like mages and sages, were able to ignore enemy defensive terrain avoid bonuses, much like Famicom era or SOV mages. Unique effects provided by emblem and bond rings carved out niches for player mages, and they generally operated as glass cannons designed to one-round enemies while taking as few counterattacks as possible. While fielding an entire army of mages was possible, it was not generally ideal because of most magic classes' limited bulk as well as the variety of options given to physical classes. So, that's the rundown of magic across the series. I apologize for the bulk of the topic, but what conclusions can be drawn from all of this information? First, magic has changed a lot, but mages work very similar overall. They're usually built more for offense than defense, and outside of Nosferatu, aren't intended to take many hits. Two, magic has broadly been consistent with its versatility. While not all games feature spells with unique effects, magic was always a readily available 1-2 to two range option that feels ready-made for killing specific targets, notably armor knights and some bosses. Three, Magic is more impacted by resistance design than by spell design itself. As resistance became higher across more enemy types, magic became more prone to looking for high burst damage against specific targets rather than using weak accurate spells on everything. This was only inverted in FE1 by its lack of a magic power stat, encouraging the use of stronger spells on a regular basis. And 4. Spell restrictions should be meaningful. If you lock high-end spells behind a high magic rank, they should feel worthwhile to rank up to get. If you lock dark magic behind a particular class line, make those spells unique enough to encourage the use of that class line over another type of mage. And those are all my big takeaways for magic in Fire Emblem. If you learned anything I didn't highlight or wanted to point out something I missed, feel free to do that in the comments or on Discord. A big thanks to channel members c 2 Pikali, Enigmatic Mr. L, the Big Herman 007, and Bro Duderman for keeping me going on this, and until next time, this is Mithril Zenith signing out.